what happened in the morning, in, including the execution of uh, some NCOs mm -hmm. uh, and the subsequent execution of the officers at C4 uh, Forest or thereabout. Okay. Um, thereafter, I would want to discuss um, your falling out with Jame and uh, the AFPRC, mm -hmm. your arrest, the reasons for it, who were the participants, what were the allegations. Thereafter, we would discuss your detention, okay. what happened to you during, the de during your detention, your eventual court martial and conviction, uh, the period you spent in prison, uh, and uh, your eventual release. Okay. Uh, and at the end of the day, if we have time, we would uh, give you the opportunity to say a few words okay. uh, to the commission and also to address the Gambian people. Okay. Those, that is the agenda for today. Thank you. Uh, but before we start, uh, there appears to be some misconception which I need to clarify. Uh, it's been suggested that you are given some use amnesty, quote-unquote, in exchange for your testimony. May I first state that there is no such thing in law called used amnesty. Uh, what exists and what I mentioned yesterday is the concept of use immunity, mm -hmm. and uh, that was just some en passant, it was just said in explanation of a statement that you made. Okay. If you recall, uh, you were asked a question. Correct. And then you stated that some of the things you might wish to say could be secret, so you would not say them. I explained to the commission uh, that there is an exception in the law which allows a witness before the commission not to testify to some official secrets, mm -hmm. but the material or the information should have that classification. But there is another rule under which we operate, that is the rule of use immunity, because a person has a right against self-incrimination. Right. So in, and there is also the rule that a person must answer a question asked by the commission. Right. So that would cause a tension. Because if the commission were to force a person to, to, to abrogate his right, or not to incriminate himself, the commission would have to give you uh, use immunity, mm -hmm. uh, which is to say that that which you say to incriminate yourself would not be used against you in prosecution. Uh, that is just an explanation I made. Uh, it certainly was no undertaking by the commission uh, that you are given any form of amnesty or immunity. Is that your understanding? I do. So there is no issue of amnesty here or no issue of immunity here. Uh, Mr. Sabali kindly confirm that you are appearing voluntarily as I said yesterday, I came from Dakar to the Gambia on my own volition. I was not forced to come to the Gambia. I felt I have to come and take part in this TRRC for the nation. Thank you. Uh, you were not given I was any not given benefits any immunity? in exchange? No. Nee. Thank you very much. Uh, I just thought I should clarify that particular point. So now let's go back to the events of November 11. Okay. Uh, in your testimony... Uh, you indicated that before you departed State House, you had a council plan to go and conduct this war and execute and kill the ringleaders, correct? Correct. Uh, you went to Fajara, to Yundum Barracks, you captured some soldiers, you kept them in the cell, correct? Correct. From there, on your way to Yundum Barracks, to, F to Fajara Barracks, some of the captured soldiers were transferred to Mile 2. Right. 
after capturing Fajara barracks, you brought the soldiers from mile two and paraded them at the field. Correct. And you targeted the ringleaders for execution, that is Dotfal and Basiru Baro. Correct. And under your order, members of the council and the soldiers behind you open fired at these individuals, they died. Correct. Yourself and the members of the council are fully responsible for those killings. I am responsible since I was the uh, commander on the ground. Uh, by their participation, the council members, by their agreement that this is what you are going to do, they were all equally culpable like you and have responsibility for those killings. On the collective aspect, yes, correct. Wonderful. So uh, now we proceed. Uh, you did, I asked you this question yesterday, that throughout the process, you were in contact with Yaya Jami. 100% correct. Did he give any orders with regards to what to do with the ringleaders? Is to execute them. Can you expansiate, can you tell us the conversation you had with him, wherein he said to execute the ringleaders? This was the moment when we captured Barrow, Lieutenant Barrow, and we found in his map pocket this book on which their orders were written. And in this book, we found out how they were going to execute us, arrest us with our families, bodyguards, and transport us to the Birkama firing ring and execute us. Then when I informed him about this information, he said immediately, we execute the ringleaders. Who said so? This is Yaya Jame, the chairman at the time. So let's get this correct. And let's, without any shadow of doubt, you telling us that when you informed Yaya Jami about the notebook you received, which indicated the plans uh, Barrow had for you, Yaya Jami told you what? He told me clearly we have to execute the ringleaders. Uh, and that is what you did? Exactly. So when you were killing, Basiru Baro and Dotfal at Fajara Barracks. Tell me if I am wrong. Okay. You did that on the basis of the agreement you had at State House before you left. You did it on the basis of the instructions Yajami gave on the telephone and you, you did it on the basis of your own agreement as members of the council who were present there and executed the act. Correct? Correct. Uh, so there is no doubt that you, Sana Sabali, Yankuba Ture, Sadibu Haidara, Edward Singate, and Peter Singate were fully responsible for the execution of those soldiers at Fajara Barracks. Two officers. Correct. Yes. So now uh, let's move on. I asked you about Babu Karjata. And it is important that we clarify this. Okay. Uh, this is not a witch hunt. Uh, the commission is interested in knowing the whole truth. Uh, we cannot leave things to misconception or conjecture. We have to try to get to the bottom of it. According to you, in your testimony yesterday, you could not remember Babu Karjata being armed. Correct. Do you still maintain that testimony? 100% correct. Babu Kar said in his testimony that during the attack at Fajara Barracks, he personally led the attack on your instructions. I asked you that yesterday. You said that was not true. That wasn't correct. Why do you think the army commander would suggest that he commanded that operation when he did not? Maybe he, in his capacity as the army commander on the ground at the time, as I said yesterday, in an operation we have different units that are on the move in advance. And probably is a possibility that where he was, at the flank where he was, he was commanding those troops, as I was also in another different direction. Uh, according to Babu Karjata, 
he said he assigned the various responsibilities. Which group must do this, which group must do that, which group must do that, which group must do that. And that he assigned you responsibility to take over near the residential areas. Is that true or false? When we enter, it's, it's, it's false. When we entered Fajara Barracks through the back door, we had not fired until when we received fire from the machine guns. And that was the time we expanded in an extended line. This was after the residential areas, and then we advanced towards the guard room. So your testimony is that Babu Karjata never commanded this operation? I am not saying he never commanded the operation. I'm saying he didn't command the area I was. I want to be very clear on record. Okay, let's, let's get this straight. Who was the leader of the operation? In virtue of my position, I was the commander on the ground. That is in virtue of your position. Uh, that is a de jure issue. Right. Now let's talk about the de facto situation. What actually obtained on the ground? Who commanded the operation? I was in command of the operation. So you cannot have two commanders of one operation? Of, of course you can. Okay, uh, I am not a soldier, okay. but it is certainly obvious that you cannot have two commanders of one operation. One person must be subordinate to the other. In an operation situation of that nature, you can even have up to ten commanders on the ground. No, having commanders. Yeah. It depends on here what... what let, 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 okay. let, let me finish, Mr. Savali. Please. Uh, you are the person there, so... <coughs> You are the only one who has knowledge of what happened. happened. Before you deployed, did you tell Babu Karjata that he should lead the operation and command the operations and that all of you were behind him? Did you tell him that? Personally, I did not because he was not armed. And this was a battle zone. Uh, that is your recollection, that he was exactly. not armed. Uh, but do you recall having that conversation with him? I did not. Uh, do you recall subordinating yourself in that operation to anybody? No. As far as you recall, you were the leader of that operation. 100% correct. And what do you say to the suggestion? Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, uh, let me rephrase. Was there a time during that operation when you needed to make a call to Jame? From Fajar Barracks? Yes. No. Uh, on you, just as you were about to enter Fajar Barracks? No. You did not make a call to Jame. Do you know a person called Sisawa Fati? Sisawa Fati, yes. Uh, was there any occasion when it was suggested that a call be placed to, to, to Jame and Babukar was so shaking that he could not even place the call? Do you recall that? Maybe in Yundum Barracks, but in Fajar Barracks, no. All right. And I will come to that later. I will explain this issue of this call. That was okay. a communication failure. Uh, all right. But okay. you're saying it was at Yundum and not Fajar? Not Fajar Barracks. Okay, good. So as far as you're concerned, did Babu Karjata play a major role in that attack in Fajara Barracks? As far as I'm concerned, since he was not armed, um, negative. Uh, but on the issue of being armed, he said he was armed. He had a pistol. Okay, that's what I'm saying. Personally, even me, I had two pistols in, under my uniform. But it's not easy to see, to be seen, rather. That's right. But... So, so, so let's not pin it on whether he had an arm um, or not. But as far as you're concerned, he did not play a major role in that attack. If he said he had, that's from his side. But as far as I'm concerned, as I said, it was an operation. And I would not send anybody who was not armed um, ready for battle in, an, in such a situation. So, so would it be grandstanding on his part? For but suggesting that he led the could attack. Could you explain to me this grandstanding, the, the correct meaning, please? Could you enlighten me more? Uh, is it just being braggadocious? He is trying to sure. so off put himself in a position that uh, he certainly was not at the mm, time. I don't know about Karyata with such attitudes. Definitely not. 
I would not lie about his attitude. So, so, so you think, therefore, then that uh, do you would you be able to s suggest what you think is a reason why he why he claimed something which you dispute? Certainly, I know maybe he must have controlled part of the flanks. This I can give the benefit of the doubt. He must have done that. And he could not have done that certainly without a weapon. Uh, maybe. Since he said he was armed, of course, then he could do that. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, when Babu Karjata arrived, mm -hmm. did he know that the ringleaders were to be killed? No. Why didn't he know that? Well, as I said, I called him to inform him about the situation that he was going to be arrested if he doesn't leave his house within two, three minutes. And then I sent Gacy B. Mendy and Dembo Jiva as a driver to go and pick him. And then they picked him and brought him. Under the circumstances, there was confusion. It was a battle zone. And you don't have time to explain certain things. Uh, at He left Yundum Barracks with you, the exactly. Fajara Barracks. Exactly. According to you guys, you fought the war and the few hours war was over, you took over the barracks. Correct. Men were paraded and executed. Correct. Uh, these were soldiers under his command because he was commander of the GNA. Did he stop the operation? No. He let the operation continue and those soldiers were executed. I don't think in his position there he could have stopped anything, to be quite honest. No, the, the question is not whether he could have. The question is whether he did anything to stop it. No. Thank you very much. Uh, so then you left Yundum Barracks. Where did you go personally? To Fajara Barracks. From Fajara Barracks? Yes, w from Fajara Barracks, after executing Dot I went to the radio Barrow. station, Radio Gambia. It was seven, before 7 o'clock, and I relayed a news on Radio Gambia, explaining the circumstances, what had happened the previous night. And what explanation did you give? I gave to the nation that there was a coup attempt, and then we have foiled the coup, and some children have died. Uh, and I did apologize to the people of Bakau, especially for the sleepless night. Uh, did you apologize to the families of those people, uh, the loved ones who, on this were, who were executed? On this particular night, no. We saw them as enemies. You did not see them as captured soldiers who were to be treated humanely? Honestly not. But you know that is illegal? It could be illegal. So after mile two, where did you go? I went to the state house. Sorry, after Radio, Radio Gambia. Gambia, yes, where did you go? We went to the state house. Mm -hmm. And then what happened? We discussed about the capture of Barrow and the killing. Mm -hmm. And then we continued back to Yundum Barracks. So, so at state house, who did you meet? Chairman Gamme. Uh, were you alone when you met him? We had, the whole council members were there. And what was discussed? We discussed about the capture of Lieutenant Barrow and Dot Fall and some of the soldiers in Yunnum Barracks who were already in detention in mile two. And we discussed what to do next with the remaining, uh, the remaining the ringleaders who were somehow on the run. And uh, what, what decision did you arrive at? We have to pursue them by any means to get them. And uh, what would you do when you get them? To execute the ringleaders. And this was also another council decision? Exactly. So this would be the second council decision to execute these people? It might not be the second one. It is not the second one. It was only to reiterate what we had agreed on before. Exactly. So uh, precisely, this is the second time a council decision is being taken to execute these people. Exactly. Was there any opposition in the council? No. It was a unilateral decision. Union, unanimous or unilateral? Unilateral decision, complete. Uh, I, I don't... Let's, let's watch the words we are okay. using. Unilateral would mean it is made by one person without consulting anybody. Okay, then unanimous agreement. Sorry, unanimous you. means all of you agreed. Okay, so unanimous. all of you have a responsibility for that agreement. Correct. So yourself and who was present? Edward Singhater. Mm -hmm. 
Tadiwahidra, Baro, so as a fella, Jami himself and Ture. By Ture, you mean? Yankuba Ture. All of you made that decision exactly. to execute these people. Exactly. All right. Uh, so this was the plan of the council. Exactly. So you left to go back to Yundum Barracks to execute that plan. Exactly. Tell us what happened when you arrived at Yundum. When we arrived in Yundum Barracks, we took out the ringleaders from our list, and then we went and executed them. Uh, that would be in the afternoon, wouldn't it? Correct. Uh, but in the morning, Fafanyang was killed, Basiru Kamara was killed, E.M. Sise was also killed. Mm -hmm. Could you recall the circumstances of those killings? When they were being killed, I was in the ante room, but I would not relinquish that in, um, responsibility. Of course, the council made the decision. Correct. So whether you were there or you were right. not there would not really matter, would it? Exactly. So would it matter or would it not? It wouldn't matter. Exactly. Simply because it was a it common a plan by members of the council. Correct. Uh, but you were in the barracks and you were aware that these people were killed. I was there for that reason. You were there for that reason. Exactly. To make sure they were killed. Exactly. And killed they were. And they were killed. By and on the order of yourself and members of the council. Correct. Oh, thank you. Uh, on that particular afternoon, when these guys were being taken to be killed, who was present? All the council members except Yaya Jami, the chairman. That means to say... I shall be sabaling. Yes. Yankubu Ture, Edward Singate, Shadi Wahidra. And Peter Singate, was he present? Uh, Babukar Jata, was he present? Babukar was present, exactly. So all these, all the men were taken from the cells and tell us the process from the cells to the, to the execution place. They were taken from the cells and then loaded into a Land Rover and then we drove to C4 area. Mm -hmm. And yes, that's proceed. where we executed them. Would you recall who was executed? Actually, I think... Kapul Kanye, if I could fully remember. He, he participated or? Yeah, he participated. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so can you tell us who was killed? In this particular, uh, it was Lieutenant Gibrin, uh, sorry, yeah, Lieutenant Gibrin says, uh, Cadet Amadou Silla, Lieutenant ML Dabo, um, I think uh, draw me across. Bakari Mani. Yeah, Nyancho, Bakari Mani. Abdullahi Ba. Abdullahi Ba. A chopping chop. A chopping, you know, correct. And uh, who else is it, Jaji? Uh, there were six. Buba Jami. Buba, I didn't know him before. I couldn't remember exactly... Lieutenant Buba Jame from the Zandarmeri? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I didn't know him before. I cannot recall exactly if he was there. Uh, yes, he Since was he was killed, yeah. He was there. Okay. What do you say to the suggestion that these people were killed simply because they tried to provoke the council members? Provocation? No. A coup can never be provocation. Okay. Where life ammunition is taken. Exactly. No. When you took them to the firing range, okay, before you left, there was a meeting in the ante room, correct? Correct. And in the ante room, it was decided that these people should also be executed. Correct. And Babu Karjata and Lamin Baro, Lamin Marong, were present in that meeting. Uh, no. I can't remember that. The day before, of course, when we went to talk to them, yes. No, this is at the ante room. Uh, let, me, uh, let me read out from the statement of uh, Momodou Marong, okay. uh, who became captain uh, yeah. and uh, later uh, 
commanding officer of uh, Yindum Barracks. Okay. This is what he has to say in paragraph 108 of his statement. Looking at the very short time Sub Lieutenant Singate spent in the signals room, I did not believe that he talked to the AFPRC chairman about permission to have the officers killed. I believe he went in the signals room to get the telephone wires that he would later use to tie the hands of the officers that would be killed. Nevertheless, I knew Chairman Jame was a brutal person and who would not object to the killing of the officers. Second Lieutenant Singate looked at me. He pointed at me with his right forefinger and he said, you are not part of it. Most probably because I disagreed with the killing of the officers. It was a compliment because I had no interest in being a spectator to a deliberate deprivation of human life. It was unethical. As at that time, the decision to kill and to participate in any killing was voluntary. The army commander did not say a word during the meeting. He did not support my motion to save the lives of the innocent officers. He simply followed the AFPRC officers as if he had no duty to speak on behalf of the officers. Is that true? I said no. The last time I saw Lieutenant Morong was on the tent when we went to the camp to talk to the soldiers. Uh, for your information, uh, Babu Karjata did confirm that yes, there was this meeting and that he did not say anything. I'm not saying there was not a meeting. We were in the ante room, but I did not see Lieutenant Morong. That's what I'm saying. This is what I'm trying to suggest to you. <coughs> Uh, Babu Karjata did confirm that Marong was present. Okay, if he confirms that, I take his word. Uh, but what I am trying to drive at here is, while you were at the ante room and you made this decision again that you are going to execute these people, this would be the third decision or the th second confirmation of the first decision. Did Babu Karjata say anything did he stop it no he didn't stop anything he did not say anything no he didn't say anything it was voluntary to go and be present or participate in this issue that he could answer himself correctly no you are the head of the operation Represent did correct. you compel anybody to follow you and participate in that no if there's any complaint uh, if I had compi compelled him to come, was the only time I called him to save his life. So you did not compel him to join you no. to go to the forest? No. So he went along voluntarily? It's possible. Uh, knowing fully well that these people are going to be executed? 100% correct. So when you arrive at the place of execution, did Babu Karjata say anything? No. Did he tell you to stop it? No. Did he tell you that it was illegal? No. Did he say he was not going to be part of this? No. And the boys were paraded? Exactly. And executed? Correct. Who gave the command for the execution? I and Abhi And your council members, did they participate in the execution? Everybody participated in the execution. Yang Kubature? Yes, correct. Sanabi Sabali? Correct. Edward Singate? Correct. Peter Singate? Correct. Sadibu Haidara? Correct. All of you participated All in the us. execution. What would you say to the suggestion that Yanku Bature was not there? I would say it is a lie. Uh, so, after the execution of these men, what did you do with the bodies? We took them back into the vehicles and drove back to Yunnum Barracks. Uh, who made the decision to take them back to Yunnum Barracks? I made the decision. Uh, who made the suggestion, if you could remember? Nee. Uh, what would you say to the suggestion that Bapu Karjata suggested that they be taken back to Yunnum Barracks for burial? But if he had not taken part in it all along, how could he say something at that particular juncture? No, he was nee. there. Nee. Yeah, he was there, of course. He was the army commander. He went along, knowing fully well that there is an agreement to go and execute these people. Correct. Wouldn't that make him part of it? Of course. Exactly. Uh, so, did Babukar suggested before the commission 
if my recollection is right, that he said, let's bury them in the barracks. If he had said so, Babukar, I have never known him for lying. If he had said so, I would 100% go with his word. Exactly. So, and according to him, the rationale was so that the dead would be safe. I Quite an irony. They would be safe or safer in the barracks. I agree with him. So, in a sense, why did you think they would be safer in the barracks? We wait them for a particular day like this. So, that they, when they have to be given back to their families, they could be exhumed and then taken back to their but families. But, Mr. Sabali, the idea was to cover up the, no. to cover up the, no. the operation. No. If there was a cover-up, I wouldn't have been at the radio station to announce that there were deaths. Did you inform the family members? No. So how would anybody know that a father or a brother or an uncle has been killed? This would be the pursuance of the army later. Did you direct the army to do anything? To no. inform the families? At this particular point, we are running around looking for those who are on the run with arms and ammunition. Uh, you have executed exactly. 11 people. Exactly. Two at Fajara Barracks. Correct. Three at Yundum Barracks. Correct. Six in Sufo Forest. Correct. You bury them in Yundum Barracks. 100% correct. No family member was informed. Correct. And you say it was not a cover-up. It was not a cover-up. What do you understand a cover-up to mean? Because this would mean that we were hiding information and we were in Yes, you were, no. you were hiding information about no. who was killed. You just gave a general information to the public that some soldiers died in the crossfire. That is what I said yesterday. Some information, you don't give it out easily like that. But in fact, there was misinformation because people were led to believe that soldiers were killed in fighting. We cannot call it anything other than fighting. And as much as weapons were drawn, life ammunition were used, you cannot call it anything but what it is. Yeah. So as far as you are concerned, fighting continues when way, be way beyond the point when people put down their weapons. In your head, fighting still continues. In the military, we have battle drills and we just go to the last one for example when you move from the first one and you get in touch with the, from the moment you take your arms and you get the briefings that you're going to meet an enemy the battle is drawn from that point and along the line you can come in contact with the enemy firefight starts at a point you have to stop that is the law come down of the fine fighting you search for your own dead and wounded your equipment and then you reorganize from this organization, it's possible fighting could still continue. And here, most of them were on the run. They have arms and ammunition, and they went into residential areas. We have no choice but to pursue them wherever they were. Uh, that may very well be true. It, it, it sets out what is ex to be expected in a normal battle, a uh, normal military battle. This is to be expected. What we are talking about is not is not the full spectrum of what would normally happen in a battle. What we are talking about is where a person has surrendered or, an, or has been captured, that person is not at that point in time fighting a battle. That person is a prisoner. Prisoner, he could be even dangerous where, where he is. We are not talking about whether the prisoner can be dangerous or not dangerous. We are saying that at the point of capture, the person ceases to become a combatant. The person becomes a prisoner. This is what we are saying. What distinguishes us, the military and the civilian, is not the uniform, but what is in the mind. Okay, I, well, is that the mindset you personally have, or is that the mindset of officers of the Gambia National this Army? Is, this is not, here we are not talking about specific army, we are talking about general. If that is the mindset of officers of the Gambia National Army, don't you think it is quite worrisome? We are not talking about the Gambia National Army, I repeat. The Gambia National Army is a professional army. 
And today is more professional if I would add that adjective there. Well, what you did on that day of November 11 is far from being professional. It's nothing to be proud about. I am not here to, uh, to defend anything or to give excuses of what had happened. I understand lives were lost, but here I am asking that... No, lives were not lost. Oh, People sorry. were murdered. If you say so, yes. All right, so uh, let's, let's uh, move on. Uh, let's move on. Uh, the bodies were taken back to uh, Yundum Barracks. Correct. Uh, were they buried in your presence? No. Uh, why not? I gave the orders that they should be buried. Uh, what type of burial did you order to be given? I only said bury them and, I, and we left for the state uh, house. Uh, you are a Muslim, Mr. Savali, aren't Correct. you? And those days you were also a Muslim. Uh, didn't you deem it appropriate to give them a proper burial? Here I would expect they do the right thing by giving them those type of burials. But under the circumstances... You were only expecting... I'm coming, please. Under the circumstances, I don't expect also anybody to bury them the way we bury our dead bodies in the normal Muslim... Why, why, why not? Aren't they entitled to decent and proper treatment? Under normal circumstances, yes. But under those circumstances, no. Why not? They were enemies. And enemies cannot be treated properly? No. I that said yesterday, there is no small enemy. There is no little enemy. An enemy is an enemy. A dead enemy is no longer an enemy. It is. You can't disqualify that from him anymore. He's still an enemy. And not entitled to any dissent or proper treatment. It depends on how, from which angle you looked at it. Please. Okay. Um, so, at the, after the burial, where did you go? I went back to State House. Uh, who did you go with? We went with the council members together. And who, to who did you go? Okay, before that, I want to explain something that we have missed. Please go ahead. Whilst we were in the guard room, some soldiers were arrested, and Lance Kubel Kebe was arrested and brought in the guard room. And there he sat down, and I was asking him, because like I said yesterday, there were two Lance Kubel Kebe's in the army at the time, Lance Kubel Alaji Kebe and Lance Kubel Amadou Kebe. So, when they brought Lance Kubel Alaji Kebe, I was talking to him, asking him exactly if he was involved in the coup that has already been foiled. And all of a sudden, Edward Singate, police pistol, bang, he fired at his right, if I'm correct, his right tie. Was it accidental? No, that was not accidental. It was deliberate. Right, correct. And immediately I saw he was bleeding. I, in fact, I nearly shot at Edward back. Why? Yeah, because it's human, it's instinct, instinctive. It just came like that. Because Why? I was talking, this is person I was talking to directly. You believed it was what? Correct? What he did? Or was it wrong? Yeah, it was wrong at this particular point in time. I was talking to this particular person, trying to find out the information. And whether, then? whether he was part of the coup or not. And then the shot came, bang. Did you feel offended because you were questioning the person? No, it's not feeling offended because I was questioning the person. Because I, I felt he should have waited until we established the correct information that he was part of it or he was not part of it. That was my mind. So, so there was your suggestion is you have not yet established a basis correct. why he should be shot. Correct. Did you indicate to... What did you say to Mr. Singate? This is later. We took together two of us. And I continue. I will come to that also. Then Please. I attended Laji Kebe's food tie. I applied tunique immediately. I carried him to the infirmary, at the clinic in the, in the hospital, in the, in the camp there. And then I asked the duty driver, the ambulance, and the medic on duty at the time to rush him to the hospital so that they could attend to him. Why did you do that? It's him on. It's a rare display of kindness on your part. As I said, in battle, anything can happen. 
But uh, do you think that uh, Mr. Alaji Kebe was the only person who deserved that kind of humane treatment? No, he was not the only one. But at this particular point, it was insensitive that it has come up that I should attend to him, and I did. But you let other helpless individuals whose hands were tied behind their backs and executed them. The difference is for me, they were ringleaders. Thank you very much. Please. Uh, so, uh, Kebe was taken to the hospital, and he was attended, and he was brought back, and he joined the detainees. All right. And why was he detained? Because later we find out that he was part of it. He was the one who was at the airport. But he was not executed? No. He was not the ringleader. That's why he was not executed? Correct. Okay. If he was a ringleader, he would have been executed? I would have done it myself then. Thank you very much. Uh, so from, from Yundum Barracks, you went to State House? Correct. Uh, tell us who was present at that meeting at State House. We were the council members. We are present, all of us. Kindly name them, please. Lieutenant Jame, the chairman at the time. Lieutenant Sanabi Sawali, Edward Singate, Yankubo Ture, and Sadibu Hydra. And what was the discussion about? We discussed that we have killed the leaders, those who we had apprehended, and we have executed them. Mission accomplished. Not complete yet. Because M mission accomplished with regards to the ringleaders. Correct. But somewhere on the run, like Lieutenant Binaminte was on the run, Sajakal Guf was on the run, and they were armed and dangerous. So we have to pursue them to find out where they are. So you had a debriefing meeting in which you looked at your achievements and you were satisfied with the fact that you have executed 11 officers. Correct. Did anybody raise any form of consensus objection to what has happened? Within the council members there? Yes. In what form, if I would... Did anybody say what we did was wrong? No. Everybody supported the decision? As I said, these were enemies. They had, if they had had the chance to get us, we would have been dead bodies at that time and buried at the Birkama firing range. But that was their mission. What would you say to the suggestion that some council members were not present during these executions. I would want to know the person who would stand and tell me I was not part of that meeting. Would you, what would you say to that person? He's lying. Thank you very much. Uh, so now that concludes our discussion of November 11. Uh, now let's move on to, to your time. Mm -hmm. Did I go past the time? Uh, oh, okay. All right. What time is it? I don't mind. Okay, ten. Okay, okay. So now let's move on to post November 11. Okay. You. There was a national consultative Committee. commission to do what? This NCC was established to sensitize the public or to ask for information from the public as to how long they would want the council or the armed forces professional union council government to stay in power before we could hand over to elect to civilian rule. However, I would quick to point out that here I was hundred percent against it. Why? The fact that when we were planning I have said it here yesterday, we had planned to stay only for six months. So for me, there was no need for any national consultative committee. So, and how was that decision taken? It was not taken lightly. Uh, yes. Can you explain the process? I know you said this again, Yes, you said it yesterday, but I want to give you the chance to reinforce that. In, in the meeting where we discussed about it, to form this NCC, as I said, I gave my what clearly we had sworn into the Quran and the Bible that we would stay in power only for six months and then bring in a civilian government. Even if it was going to be at this point a caretaker government, this is what we are supposed to do. And then it went on, we discussed, we didn't come to agree that it has to be formed. And I was one, and then we formed the National Constitutional Committee, and then they started their job. 
along a line, I think they were in Kaur or Kuntaur, I cannot remember exactly, but if Captain Bojang Mudu Bojang, who was the commissioner at the time in MID, he could attest to that. I got information that he was interfering in the way of the NCC, how they were working, or from the other end, the way the public was giving their views that we should go back to barracks immediately. And then I called him, I told him, stay out of it, let them decide what time we have to stay in power. Uh, Mr. Savali, uh, I just beg your pardon. I have to take you back to November 11, just on one important point of clarification. Okay. Uh, like I said, people have been adversely mentioned. It is only fair that we elicit evidence uh, which would put the matter to rest, okay. uh, which would show clearly whether some of the things we heard are true or they are false. false. Correct. Uh, you've dis we've discussed Babu Karjata extensively, but we have received information that uh, Mumudu Baji, who is currently the National Security Advisor, mm -hmm. we've received information that he was present at Yundum Barracks or at Fajara Barracks. What is your take on that? I was going to come to that when we started giving out our uh, commissioner positions. Mo Captain Mojubadi was never near the combos, let alone at the Fajara Barracks or Yundum Barracks. It is totally false, completely. Thank you very much. Uh, at um, uh, the forest, which of your orderlies were present? Here, I wouldn't be able to say exactly who, as I said yesterday, the orderlies were changing duties every two days. Did you have... I, I believe it might be JCB Mendy, or both of them, Nyai and JCB together, or only JCB is a possibility. Did you, as far as you can recall, give anybody or any of your orderlies uh, clearance to go home that day because of an injury? It's uh, maybe JCB or Zakaria Dabo. I, I can't remember exactly, but it's possible. We have received evidence okay. that Njai Ponkal was injured in the hand okay. and he did not go to the execution at the forest. True or false? It's pos if he said he was injured and he had permission, it could be possible. It's true. So, your, your, uh, the only thing you say is it can be possible, but you can't remember. I can't remember, but if he said he was not there, I take his word. Well, we cannot go with that. But anyway, we will not bother you too much with, with, with the issue. Uh, if you know for certain he was not there, you say it. I if you don't know, tell us you don't no, know. I don't know. You don't know. No. Okay. So then let's now go back to the, uh, to the issue of the NCC. Uh, it was just important that we clarify these okay. two things because uh, it's important that people are treated fairly, they are treated properly, right. uh, so that at least we, 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 we get the, the relevant evidence from eyewitnesses yes, yes. and be able to make a decision one way or another. Right. Uh, so now let's proceed with the issue of the NCC. NCC telling us about the activities of Momodu Boja. Exactly. And there I told him clearly, hands off, completely from this issue, let the NCC do their job. Among the council, were you all in the same wavelength with regards to uh, the future of the AFPRC? Actually, during the preparation and planning concerning the time of stay in power, we had all agreed at that particular point that we stay for six months. And after the six months, we would make a bargain or we would talk with the government to come in so that we go on abroad for further studies. As at December or say early January mm -hmm. 1995, was that position still popular amongst members of the council? No, it was only by me and Sadibu Hydra. How about the others? What was their position? I couldn't tell exactly, but they were not welcoming for us to stay only for six months. And what was their proposition? It was going to, to continue. 
So they wanted to perpetuate themselves. They wanted to remain in power. Yes. That's that your that's your testimony. Correct. All right. Uh, can you tell us what happened around 26th of January, uh, 1994? Right. On the 26th of January, I think it would be around 2, 3 in the afternoon, before, before closing, shortly before closing. I had migraine, and I called the doctor from Sukuta, Dr. Asan, and he came and checked me, and he said, you have to go home and rest. You are not resting. So I left for home. And later, Akibai, who was my permanent secretary, he brought me the NCC draft report, which was submitted on that day. And I called with Jame, and I, he said, okay, tomorrow morning, before we do the council meeting, we looked at this draft meeting, sorry, this draft report from the NCC. And then the next morning when I come, I was already arrested and in my too. Uh, let's talk about the process of your arrest, because that, that one too is important for the commission. Okay, sorry, on, on that Thursday, before I left for home, I had a delegation that was Baba Job, um, Jobate of the police, for the body of the police. W which Jobate? I think later he would become a minister, I think. Uh. I don't know his uh, name actually or his uh, nickname, but I know he was Jobate from the police. Uh, what was his profession apart from being police? I think he would have been in the CID. I, I can't tell exactly, but he was more close to investigations and with a truth to the NIA at the time or, yeah, I can't tell exactly. I don't want to lie about that. Which ministry did he head He's ultimately? I, I, you said he became a minister. I think, I said, I think he became a minister. He's just trying to find out, trying to give out the exact person I wanted to say he was. Uh, which ministry did he serve then? I think maybe Minister of Justice, if I'm right. But that would be Baba Dinding? I don't know his real name. Uh, Mohamed uh, Lamin Javate. I don't know his real name, to be quite honest. Okay, he worked with who? Who did he work with closely at the time? Um, in this meeting, they, he came with... No, the question is, mm -hmm. who did he work with most closely as at the time you had that interaction with him? This was the NIA at the time. Uh, which personality in the NIA did he work with closely? Uh, this were the information, that intelligent unit that brings information to the State House. Who was his main partner? Abba Marena. Uh, you mentioned a Fodebari as well. Do you know whether Jobate and Fodebari worked together? This I can ascertain. You cannot ascertain. Thank but the person that came to your office was called Jobate. Exactly. Okay. Could I you? Knew could you? Could you? Do, do you remember how he looked like? Could you give us a description? Mm. You've told us Jobate Fodibari. worked with intelligence, NIA, Ministry of Justice. Those are the four... These are my recollections to try to That's pinpoint right. exactly the person I'm referring to. Okay. I may be 100% wrong on that okay. side, but... Do, do you know from where about this country he hailed from? Mm, nee. Okay. Good. I can tell. All right. I we, don't know we, him much. We can go with that. that. Meeting. We can go with that, with what you've given us. Uh, that is enough to be able to identify the person. Uh, you don't know the name, so you can't confirm or deny uh, my proposition. So... You said Jobate and Fodobari came. Did ba they come with anybody else? Baba Job. Baba Job. And Sol Ndau. Sol Ndau, yes. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And in this meeting, it was Baba Job and Sol Ndau who said, or oh, they were making a proposal that we establish the 22nd July youth movement. And I told them clearly, I'm not against the formation of the 22nd July movement, but me, my time was up to leave the council because my six month term was already there. Did they see anything else? They, they saw it string, but they I think they understood. I think Solndau in the end said, you have to go, but we should have stayed. And then they tried to explain how Baba Job was trained in Libya and Solndau, how they were organizing these things so that we can consolidate as a civilian government. But I said, no, at the end of the six months, I have sworn into the Quran, I will not go against this fire. So you indicated your determination to leave. Exactly. Whether AFPRC remained or not. Certainly, yes. So what happened after that? This was, I went home, 
I called the National Council Com Committee report. This is the draft report for that day. And then I called Jami and said, we discuss it tomorrow before we sit in the council meeting. Because for him, it was like the time given was two point. Uh, are you with me? Okay. Yes, yes, yes. The Please time he was looking for was 2.5 years, 2.5 years, meaning two and a half years. And I reminded him clearly on the telephone that we had sworn into the Quran and the Bible that we are going to hand over after six months. Was he happy when you said that? Then he said, until we see, see tomorrow. Okay. And what happened the next day? The next day, we went to work. I was in the office. I was writing a letter to my cousin. And then he called on the intercom. Come to my office. I, I took the stairs upstairs. And when I come into the corridor, okay. Before this, what was your relationship like with uh, Edward Singate? Mm, okay, if I should fast track it the next day, that very Thursday, I, it's later I had to recollect and put dots together. Then I knew, yeah, that was. What did you know? When you connected the dots together. Because he came that evening, no, on, on the, in the morning, he said, we have to hand over the weapon because the civilians are afraid of these weapons in the state house. And of course, we are dealing with civilians. So I complied. I said, okay, I'll bring the weapons in the afternoon. So when I went home, I asked the guards to bring out these weapons, clean them, and take them back to the armory in the state house where they belong to. And he, Edward Singer, on this particular evening, he visited me in the, in the um, Fajara residence, sorry, Fajara residence. But for me, later I come to put the dots together, he was there to confirm that we had no weapons. For what? In the event, if there was a fight between me and them, then they would overpower us. And what happened on that Friday? On that Friday, as I said, I went to work, normal. I was writing a letter to my cousin sister, <coughs> and then Jami called in the intercom, and then he said, come to my office. For me, since we called the previous evening to discuss the NCC report, the draft report, before we sit in council, I found it necessary and normal, and I went. Immediately, I arrived in the corridor. Uh, how did you go? Did you go alone, or did you go with your guards? I think JCB would have been behind me. I never went there alone, but they stopped always in the security room. Were you armed? Of course, I was armed with my pistol. So tell us what happened when you arrived at, uh, at Jame's uh, office, his, his area. Of when I State arrived House. in the corridor, already his soldiers were there, the bodyguards were there, they waited for me and then they arrested me. Could you describe how and who was there? Um, Khalifa Bajinka was there, Almamo Mane was there, Bakari Kamara was there, Malafi Kaur was there. Um, other soldiers, I don't know them from the TSG. Musa Mane was there. Musa Jame was there, commonly called Malia Mungu. Lamin S. Kamara was there. He was the bodyguard to Lieutenant Singate. And I think Samba Jalo was there, the driver to Edward Singate. Bach. Bach, exactly. These were all very big guys, huh? Yes. They overpowered you easily? Correct. And what happened to your arm? They disarmed me. They tied me down. And then Do you mean by that? They tagged me down? They weighed me down, meaning they brought me down. And then they tied my legs and my hands together. And then shortly, Maybe three, four, five minutes, Sadi also walked into the same trap. He was also overpowered and arrested like myself. What was Sadibu's position with regards to the handing over to civilian rule? He was on my side. He too was adamant that we have six to go. months, no more. We have to go. Uh, why do you think he was arrested? Because I was arrested, he would have to be arrested. Um, and after your arrest, immediately after your arrest, what happened? Then we were brought down to the office of Jame at the time, then to the back door, 
into two waiting room uh, sorry waiting vehicles and then did you room. see mr singate at the time of the arrest actually at that point singate when we were arrested even before we were marched through the office singate came and then he pointed the pistol right on sadibu's forehead and i told him do not fire and then he lowered his pistol down and then went back into the office of jama that was the last time i saw them or saw him um did you enter jama's office at all yeah b before the arrest no but when we were being marched to prison to the vehicles yes because they drove uh, the forces through the back door did you have a word with him i, I didn't even see him so after you were marched through jama's office where were you taken we were taken into a waiting vehicle and then to mile to prison did you hear the government announcement as to what happened this would come on a monday i was later yeah. told i didn't hear it but i was later told what were you told that i entered jama's office and found him sitting down and i pointed my pistol to him and i said this is your end and then he i was frozen like a mummy and then he came this army tied me down and then that was index for him <laughs> can you describe what you mean frozen like a mummy <laughs> yeah <laughs> did he have a magic wand and say sana bayro sabali freeze and suddenly you are frozen yeah i would think i would think so um yeah i don't know why he said so but for me this was going to come in the later years for me it was like he was establishing that he's in vincible that nobody can do anything to him and then that was the beginning of his power so he suggested to people that he had supernatural powers exactly he could freeze people when he wanted yeah um and then you think that was a lie sorry that was a lie a big fat one so <laughs> so um kindly tell us about your time in detention how for how long were you in detention before you were tried uh, i was in detention from that january on the 27th that friday until in december sorry august i think they arrest me before a court martial and thirty charges were brought forward and it started the court martial started and it went on until on the 22nd of december when i was convicted for 9 years uh who prosecuted you uh justice michael felix latte sorry he was the president he was the judge of the court martial the prosecutor was akamba where from from ghana was he alone uh i think i don't know this person but it was a gambian who was with him as a legal secretary i think i don't know him was it me i think i recognize your face but i cannot confirm but i think so <laughs> yeah no it was in me okay. i i was doing masters at the time okay <laughs> at the university of the west indies okay uh, uh so it could it couldn't have been me uh, yes so i raised that question because it suggested that i prosecuted you but no, it, no, no. it was in me okay if you uh, said so no yes so so you were prosecuted Exactly. and uh, you are convicted right. did they call any witnesses against you actually they call witnesses as i said yesterday this issues of um my bodyguards harassing people were part of those tertiary charges that were levied on me but all of them were thrown out of the window however one would expect the treason charge to stand 100% it also didn't stand maybe 20% yeah force onto me and they brought in my wife and my twin brother three charges so to say on the basis yeah. i don't understand your wife and your twin brother were charged together with you in a court martial that was the intention 
because whenever I had traveled out of the country, I had given specific orders to the drivers, to the guards, that they keep these vehicle keys and no vehicle goes out of the compound. However, my twin brother, in our culture, he was also a husband to my wife. Later I come to know, after the court martial, or, or during the court martial, when the charge it came out, that Saini used to go to my bedroom and pick the keys from my wife. And then he used to go to Gambia College with this government vehicle, without a driver license. And these three charges were on that. Uh, I understand that. That is the basis of the charge. Exactly. But my question is, were they also charged together with you in a court martial? Because that would be very odd. I'm coming to that in a short moment, please. Proceed, please. And then, when these charges were read, and I was asked to plead guilty or not guilty, I pleaded for the first time not guilty. My understanding was that I never knew anything about it. And then we had a break, tea break. We were at the tea break, and Felix Michael later said to me outright, Hi, my brother, you are a soldier. These charge sheets are going to be brought on you, on your twin brother and your wife. They will be convicted, and you will not be released. So the better you sold it, you are a soldier. You can take that. And then we resume. He read the charges again. Akamba went flat on the ground that no. He take the verdict that I said I was not guilty and he will prosecute me along that line. Akamba said I overrule. Who overruled? Sorry, uh, uh, Justice Felix Michael Latte. He overruled and he read the charges again and I pleaded guilty. And then what and happened after at, that? At the end, they gave me, the first charge was two years, the second was three years, and the fourth one was four years. Uh, your investigation, who conducted it? I, the military police. And where was it conducted? In the prisons. First, we were taken to the army headquarters and told we are I'm going to go to the court martial. But the investigation team was Sergeant Jassy from the military police at the time. And I will come back to a little bit, if you allow me. When I got arrested on Friday, all my bodyguards and bodyguards of Sadibu Hydra were never arrested. Until on Monday, they were asked to go to work, and they came to work, and then that's where they got arrested and brought to mile two. Maybe a week or two later, this the records are in the prison, they could be ascertained. Dembo Jiba, who was my driver, and Wahab Kweli, who was also my driver, were released. But not to go home. They were taken to the NI headquarters and later to Fajara Barracks. And they have been schooled for two good months as to what to say when, in the event, they were called in into my court martial. Did you have to face the NIA during the investigations? Investigations, yes, and many times. Uh, can you tell us the process of your interrogation? The things that happened during your interrogation? I'm sorry. Take your time. Okay. Actually, the, all what they wanted to hear from me was that I accepted that I wanted to kill Jami and weapons would be produced to have said that these were the weapons I was carrying to carry out whatever intentions I had had against Jami and from there he was going to give me a pardon and they had brought papers that I have to sign and I refuse, totally. Who brought the papers? This where Alaji Martin was the head of all this. Could you name the individuals, all of them? Um, the ones I can remember from the military side were WO2 Alaji Martin, Lamin, Lance Kapoor Senghor, or a, he was, I think he was a Lance Kapoor at the time. Lance Kapoor Senghor. What's his first name? I think it would be Lamin, okay. if I'm correct. Lamin Senghor. I, I think I'll be correct. Do you know whether he has another nickname? Nay, I can't, nay. But uh, 
in which of the services did he belong to? He belonged to the infantry battalion Yundum. Uh, do you know a person called Assassin? Assassin, this is a... Uh, I don't know that name. You don't know that name, but this person is Lamin Senghor, and he Lance Corporal Lamin Senghor, and he used to work with Alaji Martin. I know Lamin Senghor I'm talking about used to work with um, Alaji Martin, W2 okay. Alaji Martin. Okay, proceed. Malafi Kor, mm -hmm. Babukar Bob, mm -hmm. the private soldier at the time, mm -hmm. not Babukar Mbub. Yes. Clarification, ba please. Babukar Bob, yes. Babukar Bob, he was a private soldier mm -hmm. in the barracks. Yes. But at the time, he was at the state, gu state guard. Uh -huh. And who else? And one Ndur, I don't know his name, but he was from the TSG. Mm -hmm. Okay. And PM Sar from the Gambia National Army. PM Sar. Pamudu M Sar. Okay, Pamudu Sar. Yeah, no. correct. All right. So you've mentioned Alaji Martin, Manlafi Kor, Lance Corporal Lamin Senghor, uh, Pamudu Sar. Uh, and who else? And Samba Jalo, the driver to Edward Singate. And Babu Karbob. And Babu Karbob, correct. That's right. And tell us what happened when they came to you. This were on many occasions, the daytime, in the night. That many occasions. Right. How many can you think of? I can't recall exactly exactly how the number, two? but I can I can two times more than that, more than ten times more than more twenty times more than twenty times. Yeah. And what would they do when they come? They had always come with a tape recorder, and for most of the time they would play. Jekyll and Hyde, so to say, one good team, one bad team. Good cop, bad cop. Exactly. And Malafi Kaur, since he was my batchmate in the military, he was there to play the good cop, so to say. And it was like he was to convince me to say, yes, I had wanted to kill Jame. And yes, I own those weapons that were produced or would be produced. And if I refuse, then the other part would carry on with their tortures. But still, Malaf would be there at point in time, at certain times. No, stop. He will talk. Stop. He will talk. But I never gave in. Because for me, it was like I would rather die than to lie to them. Nay. Nee. And what would they do? Okay. I have to pick certain tortures now that were meted on me and Sadi Buhedra. For, e for example, once they came, they had a bucket of water in confinement number five. I was in Sakul, I was in handcuff. I had two handcuffs and two circles on my legs. And I was completely naked in my birthday suit. They took me to confinement number five. And there I found this bucket of water. They pushed me down on my knees. And then they put a pl plastic bag, this was a Piccadilly plastic bag, the bigger one, over my head. They tied it at my neck, and then they asked me to confess. And then during the process, they would push my head, pull my head down in the bucket with water. And from the water that sips right inside the bag, between my, the bag and my neck, I realized it was acidic. Gas oil was there, essence was there, and this continued until probably I black out and they were beating me with a uh, Warrington claw hammer. This was in the hands of uh, Malavi Kaur. Who was involved in that process? The people I just mentioned, um, Alaji Martin, he was always the commander of this team. Lamin Senghor. What would you call that team? The torture team. So you, your testimony is that Alaji Martin was the head of the torture team. Every day they came, he was the head. Every day they had come to me. Proceed, please. And who else? And Malafi Kaur. This Ndur I, I talked about, I don't know his first name, but he was from the TSG. PM Sar. Um, Samba, Samba Jalo. But Samba Jalo came very few times. Yeah. And later I come to understand, whenever Samba was there, it was what, somewhere out in the prison yard. But this I cannot ascertain. Who else? You mentioned 
Samba Jalo. Man Lafikor. Man Lafikor. Alaji Martin. Alaji Martin. Who else? This Lance Kapul Lamin Senghor. He was he was there always. Always he was. He was also a constant. Constant he was always there. These over twenty instances of torture he was always present. Always there. Alaji Martin. These twenty instances of torture he was always present. Always present. Uh, With the case of Pamudu M Sar, he had never tortured me directly, but he was always standing at the door. Okay, proceed, please. Okay. And another time, they came, this was early in the morning. How do I know it was early in the morning? It was that in the, in the, in the prisons at the back, these are swamp, mangrove swamps, there are birds. When they sing, we know exactly it was prayer time in the morning. And they came, they opened my cell, they said it was time to go for washing. And then they took me across, out of the prison, across to the big side. And it was dipping me inside the water until I felt I uh, drowned. They pulled me out again. This continued until I think I swooned. I fainted. But along all these tortures, I came to understand whenever I went blackout, they were afraid. And then I also started playing along that line. But not immediately when they started the tortures, I gave in. But I played the dead somehow. And it had helped somehow. You have mentioned two types of torture. Exactly. The first is they'll put, your, they'll put a Piccadilly plastic bag, bag over, over your head. head and dip it in some liquid in a bucket. Exactly. That happened until you fainted. Uh, it ended. Then the next time, they take you to the to the to the beach. Exactly. And dip your head in the water in the sea. Exactly. Until you fainted. Exactly. And and what else? And another time, I don't know exactly where this was, but they came, put a hood on my head, on, on our eyes, me and Sadibu, and then they took us out in a vehicle. Where they drove, I can tell. But later, I found myself inside a shipping container. It was so hot that I thought we were in hell. And we were completely, always completely naked as a needle. Uh, you mentioned that in the first instance of torture, uh, somebody had a hammer. This is Malavikor. And was that hammer used at all? Each time he came with this hammer, I thought it was only for me. He had no spot where he would have beaten me with this hammer or knocked me with this hammer. I don't understand. Please. I said there's no part on my body where he had not used this hammer on my body. That's what I wanted to say. So they hit you with this hammer Completely. all over your body? Completely. Throughout this period of tortures, did you cry? Yeah, cry. I cried until I think I lost all my tears out. Did anybody try to stop this? Elijah no. Martin, did he no. try to stop this? As I said, the only time they would have a break or a stop is when I, in the end, as I said, I pretended to have gone blackout and then they would drag me back into the cells if it were within the premise of the prison yard. Could you tell us any other form of torture that they used on you? Another day they came, this was in the night, they put a hood on my head, and now since where I was, I started to orient myself quickly where, as to where they're going to take me out. And then I started counting my, my step, when we left the building, they turned left. So now I knew exactly we are going to the gallows. Or we are going to go to another door which goes inside the criminal convicts, the main yard. But since they have gone direct, and the steps were to a door where I have to step over a concrete embankment, I knew exactly now we are in the gallows area. But at this particular point in time, the thoughts that were reeling in my mind was that I was going to be taken to the gallows. But the steps continued, so I knew, no, I have passed the gallows now. And then we went, we went, we went, 
and then we stop at a particular point and then they removed the hood and then the tape recorder was there and then Alaji Martin said now this is your graveyard and whether you talk or we bury you here alive at the time where was Sadibu? Sadibu was not there I was the only one who was taken on this occasion proceed and then before I could say anything I just was blood struck at the back and I felt in this what they call the graveyard and then they started burying me it was a pit it was a pit dug out and then and then they buried me up to here and then they put the tape recorder next to my head and then they said I should talk and say I was wanted to kill Jame and Jame is going to forgive me if I say that and then I own up to owning those weapons those were going to be produced in a press conference and I refused and then Malafi course started hitting me with the hammer until I don't know exactly what went there on. Maybe I, I went into blackout. At this point, where was Elijah Martin? He was always standing giving orders. Lamin Sengor? He was also there. They were the ones who were burying me in, or who buried me. Uh, Pamudu Sar? Pamudu had never, to be quite honest, he had never taken part directly, but he was always standing at the door. Uh, how about Bob? He was part of it. Ndur? Part of it. How long did this ordeal last? This happened almost two, three times, if I can fully remember. This burial this, alive? Exactly. It happened two or three times? Three times. Same location? The same location. Same people? The same people, exactly. And still you could not be broken? No. How about Sadibu? Sadibu also had... Okay, Sadibu was not buried alive, but I was buried alive. Three times, you said? Yes. Two or three times, if I can, I think three times, to be exact, it was three times. This place where you were buried alive, where was it? This was in the prison yard, where the gallows is, if you know, would know the place. And so what other form of torture was used against you? And another time they came for me, this was in the afternoon, when they came, Actually, this issue happens many occasions, but on this particular issue, on this particular day, they moved me out. They said, today, you have to defecate and eat your excreta. Meaning, you had to eat your own poo, that's what exactly. they said. Exactly. Hey, you die, you die, you die, you die, you die, he pular a who what hande nyama do demandi. Jola? Jola, I lost my Jola now. <laughs> Sorry. And who said that to you? This was Alaji Martin and Malafi Kor. Which Alaji Martin are you talking about? This is about? W02 Alaji Martin, called, nickname called Lagos. Do you know what position he now holds in the army? No, I have no idea. So. Lagos, what role did he play in all this? He was the commander of the torture team. Every day they had come for me. And uh, on this particular day, they wanted you to defecate and eat it. Exactly. And tell us what happened. And in this position, my legs were tied together. My hands were tied. I couldn't move my hands, but I was lying on my back. They put this... Because they had tried for me to defecate, I could not. I tried. Definitely I have tried. But I could not. And then they went. And brought, from where they brought this excreta, I have no idea. But they brought excreta. And then they put it on my chest. So I had to lick it like this. I tried, but I could not because my neck could not go or my tongue could not reach it. And Lance Kapul Lamin Sangor, maybe out of anger, he just picked it up and threw it on my face and then tried to force it in my mouth. I clenched my, my teeth together and then I was so beaten so terribly that I swooned. And then when I woke up, I you was... You passed my, out? Yeah, I was in my cell. At this time, where was Sadibu? Sadibu also suffered the same situation. How do you know? We discussed together. 
Whenever I was taken, when I was brought back, Sadibu would be taken. But sometimes they take us together, they would first start with Sadibu. I think that was the Sadibu that taught us what to say. And then they will come unto me also. Uh, I think it's about time we take a break and we will return after 30 minutes. Thank you, Council. Yes, it's about time we take a 30 minute break and come back at uh, uh, 12 noon. One quick question. I always have the tendency of uh, preempting counsel, um, but I just wanted to ask uh, uh, the witness what was the fate of the notebook found on, uh, on Barrow? Important ah. question. Correct. I should have said that earlier. The notebook, when we found it on Barrow's map pocket, we handed it over personally. I handed it over to Sambaba and Daba Marena. Because Daba Marena was the NIA officer attached to the state house so that they could continue their investigations. Thank you. We uh, adjourned the meeting for 30 minutes. Come back at 12 noon. Meeting is adjourned. Kwa kodoki abe sirin ofiso ko da minto ito message yo story telephone ko no e bitu ko be gambia dawo da bitu ko babele ko sa no dawo da yeta fe ko tawo wadama wadama yana bari wasa bisa ta mulda ata nyole bikan ki janna bro da ta ko balwo service din kirala jampo o manken na kolea ko balwo service sal de mano ka je ko ale do mor fe ngol sang ala din baya mole ana lakkanu tewul wato bela ani wat su dum fanam kono balwo service la din kiralu ani la do ku nyolu e be banko karo beto kabirin carton fo koyna nalla fa ko ku ko tan so balwo service la kolto ali commande telephone la no la mel buko 9400213 Wala 3192870 Wala hankabi Alta internet yoto Alila kuru jibe www.baluo.com